Advancing the scientific and scholarly study of aging and promoting human welfare in all areas of gerontology, the core missions of GSA. This week, thousands are gathering in Austin, Texas to present, learn, and find new collaborations at the GSA 2019 Annual Scientific Meeting. Join us as we cover one of the largest and most interdisciplinary annual meetings in the world for gerontology. We are GSA Spotlight TV. Hello and welcome to GSA Spotlight TV. I'm your host, Leslie Rohde. We're thrilled to once again be covering this meeting, this time in the state capital of Texas. All this week, we'll have exclusive interviews with some of the big newsmakers at this meeting, highlight popular sessions, and profile institutions showing real thought leadership in gerontology. We'll also be emphasizing this year's meeting theme, Strength in Age, Harnessing the Power of Networks. Here's a preview of what's coming up in today's show. Oral health is an essential part of aging. Uh, it's so important because as people age, we see that dental problems accumulate, periodontal disease worsens, and it's so important for healthcare professionals to have an understanding of the important link between oral health and overall systemic health. There are about 1.1 million people in the U.S. living with HIV, and right now somewhere around 50% are over the age of 50. In addition to having the opportunity to interview the big newsmakers at this annual meeting, GSA Spotlight TV is also featuring a few of the institutions doing important work in gerontology. Here's a preview of who we'll be profiling today. We are at the Texas A&M Center for Population Health and Aging. We are a research institute that focuses on the health of older adults and actually improving the health across the life course to be able to help older adults, their caregivers, their care networks to better meet their needs, live longer, healthier lives. There's an old adage, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Helping people do the best they can at older ages is an important goal for us as a society, for physicians, and for health researchers like us. My name is Lotta Granholm Bentley. I'm a professor in biology and I'm also the executive director for the Nobel Institute for Healthy Aging at DU. We call it KIHA for short. We are in the top of the engineering building with facilitate and promote collaboration with engineers. There's a pervasive attitude about aging as a single process of decline, but the truth is that aging is actually a very complex, rich story, a rich process that includes growth and development as well as decline. We're really familiar with how our bodies change over time, where maybe we can't do the things that we used to be able to do, but there's also tremendous amounts of growth that we have. That's not a part of the story that we tend to talk about. The mission of the Fordham University Ravison Center on Aging is really to empower social workers and other healthcare professionals to make a difference in the lives of older adults, family members, and all generations. And what we do is we partner with many different agencies on different projects, and also working with students, faculty members, and community members to effect change. For the first profile, we begin with our host state of Texas. We are at the Texas A&M Center for Population Health and Aging. We are a research institute that focuses on the health of older adults and actually improving the health across the life course to be able to help older adults, their caregivers, their care networks to better meet their needs, live longer, healthier lives. What I do here is really to work to promote aging is something that happens within our center, within the university, within the state, and then nationally and globally. So I really work to have people understand how it is that we can make healthy aging the new normal. 
We focus on the practice of actually being able to bridge that gap between campus or academic uh, with the community by providing programs within the community that are what we call evidence-based programs. And these programs that were formed within a community but provided in the community in small group settings where as long as there is an adherence to the fidelity of the program and the structure of the program, then the results will have a long lasting effect for the participants of the program. Here at Texas A&M we have had a partnership for for almost 20 years, a little shorter 20 years. We've been partnering together to uh, better serve seniors, to help our seniors uh, become educated, informed, and to be active in their community. The uh, professors as well as the students here assist us in the community uh, cover more area, address more issues, and to serve more individuals. We don't have the staff to go out to the different senior centers and provide educational programs, programs like A Matter of Balance, our Crying to Disease Self-Management Program. The research really breaks up into many different focal areas. So one of our biggest focal areas is understanding about community and worksite wellness. Or another area is understanding geriatric care. What are the conditions that you associate with aging? So research that we do around Alzheimer's disease and dementia. We're also interested in healthy communities. How can we build healthy communities um, for aging? So we actually are working in communities here in the Brazos Valley as well as in Austin. We see remarkable results. It's interesting because people that you don't really think would be interested in the class come back and really do a 360 degree turnaround. Um, it's amazing what you do with a little bit of encouragement and support. When people come back to you and really ask you questions one-on-one, -on -one, you get um, remarkable um, feedback from them and they express their concerns, they express their questions, you answer their questions and then they go and do remarkable things. They come back with um, you know, weight loss of 20, 30 pounds, um, their A1Cs are much more manageable and they really um, have better, better overall health. The best part about these evidence-based programs is that they are effective. And another great aspect is that they reach hundreds and thousands of lives each and every single year. But the problem is, is that we have millions and millions of older adults who need these services. So as effective as they are, there needs to be dissemination and implementation efforts to grow and reach and sustain these programs so that they can meet the needs of vulnerable populations. The biggest challenge to success for these kind of programs is the integration of the programs and to understand that things that are so simple and can be done well and inexpensively can have a huge impact for them, whether it's reducing those healthcare costs, improving the health of people, even reducing the burden of the healthcare professionals. So it's getting them to the table, but once they come to the table, they're completely on board. The outcomes for these interventions, these programs are extremely effective. They have been shown to prevent injurious falls and related deaths but they have been shown to increase the efficacy, the confidence that an older adult can prevent a fall and manage a fall if one does occur. Our mantra in this center is active for life. It's active for life everyone, every age, every day. We believe this is the way that we will make healthy aging the new normal. We're glad to be joined now by Dr. Robert Chaponis. He is the Head of Medical Affairs, Americas Region for GlaxoSmithKline Consumer Healthcare. Thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure, glad to be here. Can you tell us how interprofessional oral health collaboration is so important for people as they age? Well, first and foremost, oral health is an essential part of aging. Uh, it's so important because as people age, we see that dental problems accumulate, periodontal disease worsens, and it's so important for healthcare professionals to have an understanding of the important link between oral health 
and overall systemic health. For example, research has demonstrated that it's important to maintain good oral health, especially for folks who may have chronic diseases such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So with, with that, it is important to expand education of oral health into the curriculum of all of the healthcare professionals, not just dentistry, but pharmacy, nursing, uh, primary care physicians as well. Because as uh, issues occur with the mouth, uh, that may affect self-image. It may affect the ability to interact socially, uh, as well as uh, physical and, and mental deficits. So it's important to establish that link between oral health and systemic health uh, from an educational standpoint. And you know, there have been many advances made. Uh, a lot of great work being done with nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, um, and even the pharmacist. I'm a pharmacist myself, and there are opportunities for the pharmacist to improve oral health. Even simple questions at the pharmacy counter. When was the last time you've seen a dentist? Um, are you having pain in the mouth? Uh, bleeding gums, for example. So the pharmacist is also uh, accessible and can also help uh, pinpoint where there may be issues affecting oral health. So the point is all of us uh, in the healthcare professionals have the capacity to be an oral health champion. Needing to work together, I can see the importance there. Share your perspective now on how, how your partnership with GSA has impacted the need for better education of healthcare professionals. Yeah, the partnership with GSA has been exceptional. Uh, when we developed the partnership about three years ago, first and foremost was creating a working group. It's led by Dr. Stephen Schumann, a GSA fellow, I might add. And the initial remit was to develop this roadmap to improve oral health. We convened a oral health forum in 2017 uh, through GSA and the working group, which brought together an interdisciplinary group of stakeholders, all with a focus on improving oral health. From that meeting, six strategic imperatives emerged, and one of them is uh, increasing the oral education of healthcare professionals. Uh, I may also add some of the other important elements of that uh, uh, workforce as well was the interprofessional relationships, setting up practice uh, opportunities for all the professions, creating oral health champions. But with respect to uh, the education, uh, that has uh, been a very positive outcome of this relationship. GSA, along with the working group, has collaborated with many societies, including the uh, American Society of Aging, the American Dental Education Association, uh, the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, and certainly the American Dental Association, all forging relationships to improve uh, the education of, of our healthcare professionals. And you said that partnership started in 2017? 2016, actually, 16, we okay. kicked it off. 2017 was the uh, Oral Health Forum, which really set the roadmap in terms of developing that interdisciplinary roadmap to improving oral health. So what do you hope to accomplish next year in 2020? Well, work still remains. Uh, to address the strategic imperatives. And you know, one of the advantages of the GSA is its ability to recruit such a wide spectrum of stakeholders, healthcare professionals, you know, from policy, research, practice, advocacy. And the GSA does a wonderful job educating its own membership. For example, at this conference, there's the interest group on oral health, which convenes on Thursday, look in the program. Uh, and there's also educational sessions focused around this topic, as well as many, many poster uh, presentations as well. So by empowering its own membership and getting people excited and uh, in, in empowering to, to go out and really spread the word on the, on the impact that they can have, an essential element of uh, oral health is also nutrition. So the team will be looking at the important link between nutrition as well as oral health uh, for the 2020 season. I understand the uh, new Surgeon General report on oral health is also coming out next year. What do you hope that report will address? Yes, it's a call to action. It's a very important call to action. The last time the Surgeon General oral health report came out was in 2000. So what I would hope to see is certainly a review of you know the vision, the issues, the challenges, but also, we have the science now, the inextricable link between oral health and systemic health. And if that compelling science message is contained within that report, I feel that's going to move the needle forward. For example, 70% of individuals over 65 have periodontal disease. 
You look at Medicare recipients, two thirds of them do not have dental health insurance. It's a medical issue, but it's also a political issue, and we really need to pay attention to that. I'm hoping the report uh, will really make the case to Congress, to healthcare practitioners, um, and to the American people who also have a vested interest. Also, I hope the report addresses communities in need, especially rural communities. Uh, because you know a lot of focus on the urban areas, but we need to think about the rural communities and the impact that uh, that, that that program can have to really improve oral health uh, across the uh, the entire U.S. Dr. Robert Robert Chaponis, thank you so much for all of this great information. Oh, my pleasure. In our next profile, the National Social Life, Health, and Aging Project Research Study at the University of Chicago aims to add to our understanding of healthy aging. NSHAP is a longitudinal population-based study focused on the links between the social world and health. Here's a deeper look at their work. There's an old adage, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Helping people do the best they can at older ages is an important goal for us as a society, for physicians, and for health researchers like us. The National Institutes of Health have made it a focus to understand aging and disease. The University of Chicago is unusual in that it has, as part of the university, a major social research organization, NORC. Most of NORC's work has to do with executing large federal data collection contracts. But it also has a tradition since its founding of collaborating with academic investigators to carry out academic research. And we value this collaboration with NORC as one of the great contributions to NSHAP and indeed to the execution of social science research. The National Social Life, Health and Aging Project is a study of older adults and healthy aging. NSHAP, as we call it, began in about 2000. This project was designed to understand how the social world affects other kinds of health and how other kinds of health affect the social world. We've discovered findings that were completely unexpected, that, that have changed the way we think about some relationships, some dimensions of health, and occasionally have changed medical care, medical practice, or policy as a result. Among our investigators, we have statisticians, we have sociologists, we have physicians, we have psychologists, but it brings together different ways of looking at the human condition. My name is Louise Hockley and I'm a senior research scientist. I'm an epidemiologist. I'm a statistician. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. I'm particularly interested in women's reproductive health. I focus on urban sociology. I'm a professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery here at the University of Chicago. Because the sense of smell system is very closely tied to brain function, we thought that as it declined, it may signal problems in our bodies and our health. So we looked in NSHAP to see whether sense of smell at the baseline uh, assessment could predict um, mortality five years later, and, and indeed it did. Um, strongly predicted mortality, much stronger than major diseases like heart disease and cancer uh, and COPD, which we know are really big predictors of mortality. I'm Kay Cagney in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago and the focus of my research is urban sociology, specifically neighborhood social context and its implications for older adult health and well-being. What we were able to do is to um, find some external data, uh, particularly on the foreclosure crisis, and look at what difference it made that people lived through that period of time. And one of the things we were able to identify is that when people lived in neighborhoods with high rates of foreclosure, they developed depressive symptomatology over that interval. So it's important to note that these are not people who said that they felt depressed in wave one of our data. They really developed depression over the period. And it's not that they experienced their own foreclosure, they were surrounded by a social and physical circumstance where you know neighborhoods became depopulated and resources became scarcer. Because of my exposure to NSHAP I pay more attention to how uh, 
individual patients' social lives affect their health. You see that the isolated older person doesn't do as well. And you see um, families that um, are rich in social network uh, that are able to keep someone healthy who otherwise wouldn't be healthy. As a doctor, you actually see the, the role of the social world on people's uh, health, and uh, it's quite gratifying. And so you see it in clinical practice, and then you go back to NSHAP and you, you say, can we find other uh, connections between the social world and, the, uh, and people's health? One of the special focuses of NSHAP is on sexuality, on sexual behavior, sexual attitudes, sexual practices, satisfaction, and we've really been the leader in understanding sexuality and its implications at older ages. One of the most important things about NSHAP is that we go to people across the whole country, uh, all regions of the country, all socioeconomic classes, all races and ethnicities, and that we select the sample in a scientific way means that we, when we get our results from NSHAP, can generalize these to the whole population. We distribute our data through the National Archive for Computerized Data on Aging uh, at the University of Michigan. NCHAP was also one of the very first studies to participate in NACTA's uh, new data portal project, and you can query and do basic analyses with the NCHAP data set right online, together with a number of helpful materials. I think if any of us could pick one thing we wanted as we get older, we'd pick good health. Helping people achieve that goal, helping our society do everything it can to improve the health of older adults is good for us as individuals, it's good for families, and it's good for the society as a whole. Now to Denver and the Noble Institute. It's focused on preventing rather than curing age-related neurological disorders. They do so partly through their unique interdisciplinary structure. My name is Lotta Granholm Bentley. I'm a professor in biology and I'm also the executive director for the Nobel Institute for Healthy Aging at DU. We call it KIHA for short. We are in the top of the engineering building with facilitate and promote collaboration with engineers. I think it's quite unique for a center on aging to be located in an engineering building because we can focus on prevention. There is a lot of bouncing of ideas, you know, when we meet in the hallways and so that's why I like a lot about Kiha. Everybody can talk to, you know, like there is no like, oh, you're the boss and I'm, yeah, there is nothing about that. <laughs> Every research group here, all the 10 people that are gathered at, at the Nobel Institute, they are ahead in their field. My lab in particular is looking at different um, metabolites as a biomarker and we're doing progression of the different neurological conditions, well, in particularly Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease and now most recently ALS. We can uh, develop algorithms with engineers that actually allow us to do prediction in the condition but also early diagnosis. I've been working on the biology of aging since 1974. I got one of the first grants that the National Institute on Aging ever gave out to do this work. And the work that we did that was funded by that grant led us to the hypothesis that people with Down syndrome age prematurely. About 80% of them will develop dementia of the Alzheimer's type by the time they're 60. And since the life expectancy of people with Down syndrome is going up and up, they represent, therefore, the largest genetically defined population that we know is at risk for Alzheimer's disease in the world. What I decided to do early on is to link with other researchers, and now we have 10 different sites that are focused on bringing in brain tissue samples and bringing in blood samples from people with Down syndrome of different ages. And so it's a unique opportunity to see what happens when they're 10, when they're 20, when they're 40. What are the things that are preceding their dementia symptoms? In this institute, we have expertise both from chemistry perspective as well as from biology perspective. So we have a really a good critical mass to pursue uh, that kind of research. We have uh, 
several different studies ongoing and several collaborations with uh, neurologists as well as neurosurgeons looking at Alzheimer's, looking at uh, concussion, as well as looking at Parkinson's disease. And so those kind of clinical collaborations are great because then we can actually do translational science. So things that we find in the lab that maybe work in cell culture models or mouse models can then progress to the clinic. I collaborate with uh, the Noble Institute for Healthy Aging and uh, my research is on applying machine learning and artificial intelligence as well as robotics to help people with mental disabilities such as uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, people with dementia oftentimes they are depressed, they are lonely and because of the shortage of caregivers in senior living facilities we use these social robots as a companion box that was amazing. I'm so happy to do Even though we are a research institute, we're also focused very much on outreach and on impact in society. One of the programs that I'm really uh, proud of that we did last fall was um, a collaborative project between uh, the University of Denver, so we work with a photography professor here. He brought his class of freshman students to one of our community partners, uh, Kavod Senior Life. They're an affordable uh, living community for older adults, and they created this book um, that helps develop these social support systems for, for older and younger groups as they kind of go through life together. Another exciting interdisciplinary project is the financial security project that we have. It involves both faculty and students from the law school, from business school, from social work, from psychology, and from the Nobel Institute. There's a very significant connection between financial decision making and cognitive function. That connection is essentially uh, stemmed from research that we've known about for 10, 15, even 20 years. So these early markers, subtle markers in financial decision making, can appear decades before we'd notice anything. When we started the Nobel Institute when I came here, we changed the name from Center for Studies of Aging to Healthy Aging. And that is key for KIHA, if I may say so. We think that the interdisciplinary groups we have here are able to touch on many aspects of successful aging. And it's quite unique for, to have that breadth of, of interest and to have these kind of unique research groups who can touch of on all of these different aspects of aging. So I really think we will make an impact in society. We're happy to be joined now by Dr. Charles Emlett, who is a panelist here for a session about the population of Americans over 50 living with HIV and AIDS. Welcome. Good morning. We want to talk about this population first. How large is this population? There are about 1.1 million people in the U.S. living with HIV and right now somewhere around 50 percent are over the age of 50. So we're, we're approaching uh, about a half a million people. And that, that population has been growing, I understand, over the last few years. Why is that? Well, it's really a confluence of two uh, phenomena. One is that uh, about 17% of all new HIV diagnoses every year are in people over 50. So they represent a portion of new diagnosis. That said, that uh, people are living longer, they're living uh, you know, almost uh, uh, natural length lives, and so there's a phenomenon of people that are long-term survivors and growing older. And so these are really two different populations, but they converge to create this rapid growth. What are some of the current challenges that this population is facing? Oh, there's so many. There's, there's, uh, there's medical management of the HIV disease that gets superimposed with uh, chronic diseases of, adult, of older adulthood. You've got a lot of psychosocial issues such as depression, uh, HIV-related stigma, social isolation. Many things, many challenges, and we also, um, I think, wanted to mention the diagnosis of these people. There, it's a challenge, actually, for, for them to be diagnosed. Yes, uh, a lot of the symptoms 
early symptoms of HIV disease are confused for other things because there's low clinical suspicion. Medical providers don't think HIV, and neither do many of the older adults. So some of the symptoms they have around malaise or fatigue or um, somewhat vague symptoms are not thought of as possibly HIV. The result of that is that there's about 35% of older adults diagnosed with HIV receive what's called a late diagnosis. That means that clinically, they're advanced clinically. Uh, the HIV is advanced clinically, and they're much closer to an AIDS diagnosis. And it could have been easier to treat them if they were diagnosed earlier. Treatment, earlier treatment is always better. Let's talk about some of the successful implementation strategies that you've seen in helping this population. I think one of the, the most important issues, especially psychosocially, is, is surrounding people with support. And we know from the research that social support is key and keeping people connected. The systems are, are not well connected. The HIV system and the older adult, kind of older American Act system are not well connected. And so some of the really uh, successful models around the US, uh, GMHC in New York City, some work that's being done in San Francisco, uh, works to integrate uh, HIV care and, and uh, care for older adults. So we're seeing some of those, when the, when the groups work together in a better way, that the strategies work better. Yes, but they don't work, this, it's rare that they work together. Okay. It's really in, in HIV epicenters, you know, large cities that those systems work together. I think that's one of the most important things to consider is that this is an incredibly diverse population. So they're diverse in terms of gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, um, the, the, the way in which they uh, were infected with HIV. It's this intersectionality of often uh, populations that are disenfranchised. And so you can't necessarily compare a 65-year-old heterosexual woman's experience with a 50-year-old uh, gay man. What do you think your peers need to know about improving the lives of these people in this population? I think the biggest takeaway is don't make assumptions. See people as individuals, recognize their diversity, and find ways to coordinate and get those systems to talk to each other. And that's probably one of the most important things. Dr. Emlett, thank you so much for thank all you. of this good information. Great, thank you. Now, we want to highlight a department focused on disrupting ageism. For our next profile, GSA Spotlight TV heads to the Virginia Commonwealth University's Department of Gerontology. There's a pervasive attitude about aging as a single process of decline, but the truth is that aging is actually a very complex, rich story, a rich process that includes growth and development, as well as decline. We're really familiar with how our bodies change over time, where maybe we can't do the things that we used to be able to do, but there's also tremendous amounts of growth that we have. That's not a part of the story that we tend to talk about. So we have a singular focus and a singular story of aging, and that's what needs to change. The Department of Gerontology at VCU is a combination of an academic unit and a social movement all rolled into one. We have the only Masters of Gerontology program in the state of Virginia. We have a post-baccalaureate certificate in aging studies, and we have a dual certificate with School of Pharmacy and School of Social Work. We also have the only assisted living accredited administration program in the nation. Being a VCU gerontologist is different because we have two foundational principles that we use and that we embed in all of our research, our service, and our teaching. Those principles are disrupt ageism and aging into elderhood. We tie together research, teaching, and engagement by ensuring that our research infuses what we teach in the classroom. So we have done research on ageism and on elderhood, and these inform the ways that we teach and what we teach in the classroom to students. Students have opportunities in the classroom to practice disrupting ageism, 
and to explore the idea of elderhood as a distinct life stage. And then they have opportunities to practice these in the community through community placements and through work opportunities. We consider community engagement or community outreach to be a part of all of our academic mandate. In the community, mostly what we're doing is focusing on dismantling those existing systems and disrupting those thoughts that exist about ageism. I've seen really wonderful impact from the Longevity Project from our Age Wave initiative. Part of that is about workforce development. Um, as we mentioned, this notion of focusing on social connectedness has given us the opportunity to think very strategically about how we want to engage people across all sectors. But mostly, I think it has been about connectivity and connecting agencies and service providers that wouldn't normally be talking to each other. But if our goal is to promote longevity equity, we need to make sure that those groups are connected. The department is interested in elderhood and ageism, and I've implemented them into my health behavior change research. So I do health behavior change and health promotion. So the idea of health promotion is basically improving people's health, not in the clinical setting, but in the community setting, giving them, empowering them with knowledge. I empower them with skills, and then I empower them with support uh, to create health behavior change or improving their medication safety by telling them about interactions that happen in the medication. I provide them value and support just to tell them that it's okay um, to change your health even in late life because it will help you improve your quality of life for many years to come. Senior living has had quite a lot of growth and development over the recent years, but unfortunately it's still perceived as an industry that is characterized by poor quality of care. In addition to that, there is an issue with access because it's very expensive. And so we have this sort of expectation that we need to go into poverty in order to access some of these long-term care services and supports. The Aging Services Network fills gaps where individuals have needs. So, for example, if someone has a need with food insecurity or housing or health care. And in addition to those direct services, they provide a level of advocacy at the local, state, and national levels addressing issues related to access and equity. This isn't just about our current population of older people, this is about all of our future possible selves and how we think about our future possible selves and how we think about each other. Everybody has to find their own way of disrupting and find the the courage to be able to do that in day-to-day -day social interactions, which is in fact where most ageism occurs and is perpetuated and recycled. It's the less disruptive thing to do to let it pass, but if we want to stop it, we do need to disrupt it. The future of aging looks bright. We are in the midst of a longevity revolution. We have never in, in the history of the world lived this long and, and been this active, involved, and healthy. Technology has really created this longevity revolution and we can only benefit from that. So the Department of Gerontology at VCU is dedicated to pushing the envelope on changing the narrative of the single story of aging as decline and to educating students to create environments that are more person-centered, more inclusive, and more equitable. Incredible work happening there. And now to another inspirational institution, Fordham University's Ravazan Center on Aging and Intergenerational Studies. The center is nationally recognized for its work in the field of aging. Here's a more in-depth look at what they do. The mission of the Fordham University Ravazan Center on Aging is really to empower social workers and other healthcare professionals to make a difference in the lives of older adults, family members, and all generations. And what we do is we partner with many different agencies on different projects and also working with students, faculty members, and community members to effect change. It creates synergy that makes a very unique opportunity for us to develop knowledge and develop practices and further our understanding uh, of older adults and their families. 
As we know, the older adult population is the fastest growing segment of society. Age 85 and older are growing faster than any other part of society. So we felt that this was very important to look at um, at the Ravison Center to help older people prepare as they age to talk with their physicians, their nurses, their social workers, to gather the information about how they could improve and keep quality of life in their health. The Carter Burden Network uh, collaboration with the Fordham Ravison Center um, on Aging is a wonderful opportunity for us to help educate our seniors about how best to communicate with a health care provider. We know that this is a very important aspect of overall health and wellness. I can say that the feedback we've received from our seniors has been overwhelmingly positive. They're always looking for ways to improve their overall health, but more importantly, it can help to empower them to be better advocates in taking care of their own health. So another program we work on is palliative care. And we have the Palliative Care Fellowship at the Graduate School of Social Service, which is one of very few in the entire country. The Palliative Care Fellowship has a number of components. The heart of the fellowship is the internship that the students do. And they do this with experienced palliative social workers. They're working on inpatient palliative care teams in hospice, in oncology, long-term care, pediatrics. And then they take two courses, palliative social work, and grief, loss, and bereavement. They meet with a career mentor throughout their fellowship year and in the year after to help them really strategize their career and to get that career going. There are a lot of patients out there who need specialty palliative services, and there's not enough trained social workers in the workforce to meet those needs. So this program is intended to contribute to that workforce. What is important to look at is understanding outcomes. And in doing this, outcomes have to be measurable. And what we try to do in our research within the communities is helping agencies and organizations how to look at the change that they're desiring and how to see if it's really affecting change. In my role as program director um, for Westchester County Department of Social Services, a federal grant called Westchester Building Futures, I spearhead along with an, an amazing team of researchers, direct service professionals, and community-based advocates, a grant that focuses on serving young people in foster care ages 14 to 21. Really our purpose in the grant is to really think about ways in which we can improve outcomes for young people in care, really through the lens of youth, voice and choice, and equally importantly, family engagement. So that is really working with all members of the family, from the grandparents to the younger siblings, and working with Dr. Jana Heyman, who's our principal investigator, and her leadership at the Ravison Center has really been a great partnership with the Westchester County Department of Social Services. We train our coaches to help our many thousands of caregivers here in Westchester County to better care for their loved ones. The coaches are trained by healthcare professionals, so we have social workers, we have nurses, uh, we have geriatric care managers that train our coaches. The Ravison Center is really working on diverse caregiving initiatives. My own research is looking at um, long distance caregiving. You know, we find that the average live 500 miles away. We have some caregivers in our sample that are international. And so we're trying to understand what the challenges are for them and what kind of services can support them in the world. And we work with the Ravison Center in terms of dissemination. The Raffeson Center is a great training ground for our students to learn about research, learn about understanding connecting research to social work and social work practice and policy, and they get them ready. That integrated approach is a real unique aspect of the Raffeson Center. I did two internships. So my first year I was able to work with high school students and gain more of an administrative experience, whereas my second year I kind of went to a different level and did more clinical work, working with older adults, and which also gave me a nice introduction to the Ravison Center, which is where I'm able to kind of put all that into use. 
One area in particular that resonates with me is um, their focus on minority populations. Um, and so um, one of the areas that they've started to explore a bit is looking at um, LGBT health um, and trying to focus in on the needs of LGBT seniors and how do you promote resiliency and positive health outcomes among uh, the elderly population. And what's critical is that we don't just do the research, but we replicate the research and then we see what works in practice and how not only do we take that practice, but what we learn from it, the lessons learned, and how we can affect that change, not only in the practice and the research, but in future policies and future policy decisions on a larger basis in communities, statewide, nationally, as well as internationally. That's it for today. Thank you for watching. We'll have much more coverage from the annual meeting here in Austin tomorrow. See you then. Thank you.